Good morning. Can you hear me? Hi, my name is David Tinsley. I'm part of uh, B-Sides uh, Tampa's volunteer. I'm here to introduce uh, the first speaker. And that's Joe Blankenship. Blankenship. He's a researcher of all things digital, and he's founding a company, the Cyber Geographic Research Institute International. And he's going to talk to us about manifest destiny in the 21st century. Ooh. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I am a soft talker, so if I start like speaking not so loud, tell me to speak up. Uh, you can yell at me. I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, if you were at bar camp earlier this year, um, this is going to be roughly the same talk. I've been kind of in a legal battle with uh, a Fortune 500 company recently, so I've been having to put my research on hold for like five and a half months. So if any of you have done that, you know that's quite the process. So, um, but for you, for those of you who haven't, um, it should be an interesting talk. Um, I think it's an interesting topic. It kind of bridges both the quantitative, qualitative sciences, bridges soft science, hard science. But it helps provide insight to a lot of cybersecurity issues, a lot of things that occur inside cyberspace that you wouldn't necessarily think are connected. Um, and like Dave said, um, I have a nonprofit, um, the Cyber Geography Research Institute International. Um, it's essentially just a forum to help facilitate and encourage uh, cyberspace research, create an open space where you, people that are open sourcers, open researchers, citizen scientists can go in there and provide inside ideas and uh, collaboration. So, start off with a little video here. So. I still twitch when I say cyber. I'm a believer. I'm just not sure we know exactly what we're doing in it yet. And until we do, I'm concerned it's a black hole. And so you just need to know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be going a little slow on the operational side of cyber until I really understand what we're doing. So I'll be the one you're dragging, Willie. <laughs> I'll warn you now. But we have a lot of people in this discussion who don't really know what they're talking about. I know because they're all like me. We've got to get smart about this. There are people who can help us. But please, when you come to educate us, don't come in using cyber talk. We don't get that. I haven't figured out what an IP address is yet. In 30 years, you'll have experts making these decisions. Right now, you've got idiots helping to make these decisions. And so common sense. Plain English would really help us. So it's quite telling. Um, so for those of you who don't know who that is, that's uh, General Walsh, who was uh, who was Secretary of the Air Force uh, back in September of 2012. So not too long ago, people with billion-dollar budgets were pretty much in the dark about a lot of things that were going on uh, cyberspace. And of course, they're more worried about the cyber threat side of things, but. Cyber threats are not entities in themselves, they're symptomatic of other things. So that's kind of what this talk is about, is looking at the multi-scalar picture of what cyber threats are within cyberspace and trying to def better define what cyberspace is to then gain that micro-scalar insight. So the first part of that is trying to develop a metaphorical construct. Human beings have a very embodied way of understanding things. Um, if you read uh, George Lakoff or Dr. Johnson, they have a book called Metaphors to live by and metaphor or philosophy in the flesh, which essentially goes into how um, how we construct reality and how we construct our understanding is an embodied process and a sociocultural process. So, the reason why policymakers have problems understanding what we understand is because they don't have the metaphorical translation translational construct for us to easily translate what we understand, what we know, to them in on terms of what they understand and what they know. Um, so this is kind of an attempt to answer that aspect of this as well as develop a, a science behind how to not only translate these things for policymakers and for laymans, but also to build the science of understanding what cyberspace is and can be and is what, what it's currently evolving um, as. So um, this is a great quote, and whether you're doing cybersecurity or you're just a you know, hobby hacker or anything like that, it's a really good rule to know about cyberspace. Um, Tobler, um, back in the 1800s, was a geographer who established a bunch of standards for understanding the baseline of what geography um, can help you understand, uh, one of which is understanding that everything is related, whether it's human, physical, cyber, doesn't matter. Um, but things that are closer are more related than things that are distant. So the same thing applies inside cyberspace. 
Um, just a brief overview of what geography is. I'm a geographer, is one of my background, uh, background trades. Um, geography is the study of space, place, scale, and time, and it's understanding how these things interact. Um, they fall into two main categories, with a third being GIS or geomatics, um, but physical geography and human geography are the two main fields. Um, physical geography studies kind of the physical world as it naturally occurs, the, the earth as an oblate spheroid and mountains, hill, valley, stuff like that, kind of borders with earth sciences. Human geography studies how humans interact with that physical geography or physical geographies. Um, everything from geopolitics to geoeconomics to um, uh, human to machine interactions, those are all part of human geography. Um, and what I'm arguing is that cyber, cyber geography kind of bridges both those because cyberspace and cyber geography has its physical geography, has its human geography, but it doesn't obey the same laws of physics or the same laws that human and physical geographies do that we live in. Um, programs can be in more than one place at a time, um, just an example. Um, but I would argue that cyber geography isn't just derivative of both human and physical geographies. It's actually its own field of study, and it should be developed as such. Um, because cyberspace, much like a universe, is always expanding. And it's expanding on different scales and different, uh, by different reasons than our geographies expand and evolve on. So when we look at cyber geography, we should understand that the physical geography portion of it is finite, but it's always expanding, kind of like our universe. It's always expanding and fluctuating. Um, However, it is also a human geography, but it's abstracted. We use computer code and programs to help understand, develop, and manipulate bits, bytes, and things that are constantly flowing through cyberspace on the orders of petabytes and much larger. So we develop these ways to interface with it. So it is human, it is physical, but it, it's very much a unique geography unto itself. Um, the beautiful thing about it, about cyberspace in general, and cyberspace being anything inside, not just computer networks or the internet or World Wide Web or anything like that. Cyberspace is anything in between an input and output device that can be digitally transformed, like anything M2M, anything like that. Anything that can be absorbed digitally, um, which to include human beings, actually. I'll get into that. Um, it really has no limits except those placed upon it. Any programmer who is savvy and creative can do things that are amazing inside the digital realms that are not nearly as possible Plus, you're leveraging computers that have computational speeds that are far faster than a human brain. So really, it's, you're limited by your imagination, and people are getting more imaginative by the day. That's both good and bad. So a lot of people here that are focused on cybersecurity, like I said, it's both good and bad. You, know, you have people that are being innovative and creative, but you also have people that are out there being very destructive with that same creativity. So it's a fine line, but it's one that actually has to happen. Um, However, we'll get into the third part of the speech, which goes into the fact that the more limits you place inside cyberspace for both individual and group user bases, the more conflict between those bases you'll see, um, mainly because we are really good at reconstructing what we, what we do in our human geographies in other geographies like cyberspace. So um, those conflicts re-manifest themselves. Um, I'll just breeze over this really quick, um, kind of just to show you the evolution and stuff like that. So, the Industri Industrial Revolution took quite a bit of time to develop and execute over, you know, given the technology we have. So digital technologies going from ARPANET back in 68 to MILNET and then to USENET, the evolution of the, the infrastructure baseline, the beginnings of the Internet, took 14 years to evolve. That's much more rapid pace than the Industrial Revolution, um, mainly because we found better and better ways of te technologically fixing problems. The beautiful thing about this is that it completely erased friction of distance for a lot of communication means that previously took much longer to execute, which meant that, meant that collaboration, interaction between actors and groups could be shrunk to almost nothing, and that's globally. And today, it's even much more impressive. You're looking at extremely fast, you know, maritime lines that connect to land routes, that connect as many people to the world that can actually afford to be connected to it. Um, to the internet, and therefore those humans and their brains become part of that cyberspace construct. So 7 billion and counting, that's all that is just processor speed waiting to be tapped into. So a friend gave me this. Um, Shodan, um, a few months back, pinged every device they could find on the internet. Um, and they thought it was a pretty good representation um, of what the physical geography of cyberspace could be. 
Um, and I thought it was pr a pretty bad idea because it's really only showing you what you would expect. You know, developed countries that have internet connectivity and a ton of devices connected to it showing peak, peak usage and those that don't have a lot of connectivity not showing a lot of usage. But that isn't a really good footprint. So I went ahead and I looked at World Bank data. And World Bank shows you a little bit more of what you would expect. You see developed countries with the most penetration to the internet. And then developing countries coming up and then obviously the underdeveloped countries in Africa and other places having very limited access to cyberspace. So, you know, it's getting closer, but I didn't think they were very adequate representations of the physical geography of cyberspace. So I thought cartogram would be a much better way of going about it. So here we see the size of the country being the, the, the count user base of people that have access to the internet. And then the color being the percentage of that total population with actual persistent penetration, persistent usage. So here, once again, you see what you would expect. So of the World Wide Web, the internet, um, that people, most people generally use, um, you see developed countries having the most access, developing, developing countries with a growing access, and then you see underdeveloped countries like Africa, like those in Africa, almost non-existent. So it shows you better the gaps and the, the faults of connectivity and access to the internet. But it also gives you a better idea of what the, the potential physical geography of cyberspace could be. You, and not just digitally, but socioculturally, geoeconomically, and geopolitically. But then you think about other networks that aren't even part, counted as part of that census, part of that audit. You have tons of users um, in developing and underdeveloped countries that are on Tor and other inter intranets or intranets that aren't part of normal internet audits like what Shodan would perform. Um, so you see a lot of countries in Africa with a significant signature that you wouldn't ordinarily think they would have on networks like Tor. So you start seeing that there are multiple worlds within cyberspace that you wouldn't necessarily think would exist because most of us just think of well, not most in here, but most people think of the cyberspace just being what is currently known as the internet or World Wide Web. They don't think of other networks or other digital spaces and places that people create for themselves to then port in and out of the bigger digital world. So it brings me to the second part of this, which is how do we better understand the physical and human geographies of cyberspace better? How do we understand how not just humans manifest themselves in digital spaces and places, but how humans create new places out of these spaces. So I thought, thinking of a biological terms, thinking of ecologies, um, study of ecosystems and their interaction between organisms and their environments. So in cyberspace, this kind of points towards both humans and programs, because humans build programs as, as, as abstracted manifestations of our needs and wants inside these spaces. But these programs can take on lives of themselves. They can do things once we execute them without our, you know, our nudging or anything like that. They'll go ahead and do their operations and they'll grow and now that we have mach machine learning algorithms, you know, better developed NLP every day, these programs evolve. Not on, not on the scale that we would think humans evolve, like, you know, moving towards singularity, but more of on the scale of, you know, organisms that we see in natural environments, you know, a starfish or a deer or some other mammal that has, you know, a set function with the environment. They do certain things and these things can be categorized and watched. Same thing with programs and the humans that are governing them or deploying them. So if you think of cyberspace, like I said, you think of it as kind of a universe or a series of universes that are interconnected. Um, it, like I said, it's always expanding, always in fluctuation um, based upon the you know, hardware, networks, human beings that are connected to it. But like I said, the human mind is probably the most interesting part of this because we look at cyber threats and we see the symptoms of these things. You'll see, you know, people attacking firewalls, people attacking your networks, and we look at that as the, the whole the whole of the attack. We're not looking at the the, the per, per, pervasiveness of the human mind and the sociocultural and geopolitical reasons why these people do these things. We're looking, so you look at the human mind; it's always pumping out and taking back in content, um, which is not only augmenting what's inside cyberspace, but augmenting cyberspace itself, because the human mind can contain 2.5 petabytes worth of memory, and you're also adding processor speed at the speed that the human can think and type in things to the keyboard or other devices. So every time a human mind connects via a smartphone or a computer, it's becoming part of cyberspace. 
and it's actually causing it to grow because the human mind promotes ideas, controls media, influences media, and also puts programs. And I have an answer by programs because programs, in my opinion, become entities within cyberspace itself, become part of the, organi the organic uh, fabric of cyberspace. But what happens whenever we disconnect? Whenever humans disconnect, what happens inside cyberspace? Does, do programs cease to function? Do people, you know, does, do things cease to exist? And they don't. Things actually still happen once you disconnect or once other people can disconnect. So in trying to understand this, I, I was kind of thinking about um, the writings of uh, Dr. Martin Dodge and Dr. Rob Kitchen, um, who wrote a book called Code Space, in which they um, explore how humans and code interact um, it just was published in 2014, so it's a pretty good read, and I recommend it. But uh, they recommended, or they suggested in the beginning, how programs have kind of this uh, organic taxonomy, uh, similar to like Homo sapiens, something like that, so genus family, stuff like that. So looking at programs in that aspect, we can scale that up and look at the macro scalar effects of that, which are how do these programs and humans fit inside ecosystems, and how those ecosystems build into bigger habitats where those ecosystems interact with each other, and how do these habitats grow over landscapes, so, and you're looking at how these things change and grow and shrink down depend on a few factors. You know, how many humans are involved, um, how many programs are involved, how the humans are interacting with the programs, what data is involved between both of those. And you're also looking at the topologies upon which they're operating. You're looking at the physical topologies of their networks. You're also looking at the humans involved in manipulating the networks. So. So if you look at the universe and you look at this metaphor of building ecologies within this universe, you have worlds, you have landscapes, and you have essentially this you know, amazing metaphor by which to understand how cyberspace works and how threats manifest themselves in cyberspace, how humans interact with these things or go between landscapes and worlds, how programs and data transition between those, and how those things manipulate and either manifest a direct threat or maybe an indirect threat. So. This gets, the third part now gets into the, how the, the human abstracted geographies of cyberspace manipulate and use the physical geographies to do certain things. And this is kind of the, the point in our history where both legislatively and on the individual level, how we're all working together to define where this particular concept of go, is going. And I, I use manifest destiny as just kind of a way to metaphorically understand what I perceive is going on, which is you know, the, back in the 1800s, you know, the U.S. had this idea that it was our innate right to expand coast to coast and to not only have control of the resources, but to have political, social, economic influences so that we could truly realize the, the greatness of our potential. Um, the problem with this is, is obviously we displaced and killed a bunch of people, organisms that they got in our way in order to expand railroad networks and stuff like that. So. Even though we became a really great nation and a huge geopolitical, geoeconomic power, it came at an extremely large cost. And it's this metaphorical construct that you kind of have to understand because we're doing now the same things inside cyberspace. Individuals and larger organizations, both capitalist organizations and state organizations, geopolitical states, um, are coming into conflict because both of them have an innate understanding of what they believe to be their, their uh, their inherent spaces. And we've already started creating our own places and these things are coming into conflict. So when the, when the internet first started coming out, you can start looking at the evolution of civilization metaphor as the way that we're now manifesting that inside cyberspace. So if you look at tribalism and apply that to cyberspace, you know, look back in the day, tribes existed, you know, some very small groups of people that had one or two primary functions, hunting, gathering, um, migration, um, very basic functions, but you know, they, they didn't last very long, but you know, very limited functionality. However, as resources became, uh, resources and technology came more available, these tribes were able to grow into you know, uh, consortiums, essentially chiefdoms. So tribes came together and were able to start start doing agriculture, start doing that stuff. So the same thing applies in cyberspace. There are resources inside cyberspace like knowledge, information, uh, different programmatics, different source code. All these things are kind of battled over and used. If it's not open source, it's black box. And if it's black box, then that becomes a, a resource for somebody on inside human geographies and political geographies and 
So if you look at these evolutions, you start seeing the potential for conflict. That's essentially what I'm getting at. Um, so right now, I would argue that we're still kind of at the chiefdoms level. You have larger groups and individuals that are still floating in and out of each other, but you're starting to see conflict over resources. So in the future, I mean, is there potential for cyber kingdoms, cyber republics, these manifestations of very human geography, things like nation states um, and regional consortiums like the EU? Are these things possible to be manifested inside cyberspace? You could argue that they already are, um, but not to the extent of control and uh, uh, penetration that people currently, people and states currently have now inside human geographies. But um, my concern is that as we continue to continue to define cyber geography, you also increase the, uh, the risk of conflict with inside cyberspace. So it's a, it's a fine line between trying to explore and develop ideas and also trying to better define yourself within cyberspace by creating your own places. Um, but as you do that, you'll, become, you'll come into more and more conflict as that becomes better defined because other people will have a need for what you have and they'll believe that it's theirs innately just because it's a shared space. So it's either maintain shared space and maintain openness and maintain sharing or try and capitalize on certain things and then create conflict. So it's uh, at this point inside cyberspace, our best defense currently is our own ignorance of what is actually going on, which isn't gonna hold out for very much longer. So, so what does this all mean essentially? Or what am I driving at? Or what my general idea is? Like I said, this is just ideas. So I'm more than open to criticism. So I actually like that. Um, so right now, you can form this kind of dialectic. You have non-state actors and state actors. Non-state actors being individuals, um, small groups of programmers, um, or just people that just want to get online and look at the internet, look at the news, watch videos. And then you have state actors like, you know, the United States, the EU, uh, anybody that has uh, any kind of, you know, legislative purview over individuals within human geographies and physical geographies. Um, both these people have innate impressions of what space is inside cyberspace, not just within human geographies, but inside cyberspace itself. So as both these groups start defining space, place, scale on their own terms within their own time scale or time frames, you'll start seeing growing conflict. So anonymous obviously has a different sense of space, place, and time and scale than the United States government does. So because they have these differences and they don't have these understandings, and they don't, can't, can't create a metaphor by which to communicate with each other over these conflicts, you'll see what's perceived as either cyber criminality or cyber warfare. But as of right now, we're just trying to fight over what we consider cyber territorialism, which is essentially saying, hey, within this entirety of cyberspace, we perceive these places as our own. And we've, we've been working very long at this, and both parties will be saying the same thing and not coming to any conclusion. So when this occurs and people start conflicting over things and trying to get things that are perceived not belong to them, you have the potential for cyber warfare. And I don't believe we're at the point where cyber warfare truly exists and what, so if you just take away the cyber and think about warfare, we, don't, we haven't have a situation currently like that, or at least that's very overt. Um, right now we have what I would consider a pervasive state of cyber criminality, even if it's not intentional. Um, you saw people going and doing things, you know, pseudo illegally, you know, whether it's, you know, Pirate Bay or going to the tour and going to Silk Road, or even if it's just inadvertently downloading something that, you know, had wasn't copyrighted at, at this point and you use it for something else. You know, it's, there are certain levels of cyber criminality, but it is pervasive because the borders aren't there. It's not defined. So, this is the state that I, I currently worry about and what I'm trying to study through my organization is trying to figure out not just what cyber geography is, how do we find space, place, scale, and time, um, but how this all builds together and tries to understand and elaborate on the definitions so that we can kind of avoid cyber warfare and help avert cyber criminality. Um, so what are the best ways to do this? Um, for the longest time, um, hackers have had this ethos, do no harm. Um, one of the first things that we need to consider, not just hackers, but anybody in, involved in using cyberspace or any kind of digital realm, is redefining what we consider to be the ethics of that space. What's, what's the best mutualistic agreement that people can come, come across as a social contract 
to, av to avoid any kind of conflict. So this involves, you know, mass collaboration, you know, creation of shared spaces so that people can agree on certain things or agree to disagree, but do it safely and securely so it doesn't compromise anybody's personal interests within that space. Also getting hands-on, increasing education and knowledge of these things, and also the free exchange of information, both in programs and in knowledge. So, and that's what I'm trying to provide on my end. Um, but uh, that is pretty much all I have. Um, I thank you very much for listening to me, and uh, I open the floor to questions if you have any. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, what? Okay. So, did did Russia openly declare that? Okay. So the question was, why do I not consider the cyber attacks that happened between Russia and Georgia and Russia and Estonia cyber warfare as opposed to cyber criminality? Um, I don't. Did did Russia openly declare that? Hey, we actively did this and. So, so without the overt declaration of war by by a nation state, a geopolitical entity that is the Federation of Russian States, it's technically a criminal act that was done covertly by the government. Even though we know it happened, the nation state didn't openly declare legislatively that hey, this is an act of warfare, and we are using this cyber aspect of warfare to do that. Like I said, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an international lawyer, but my perception is that what they did was a criminal act. Just like if someone kills a bunch of hostages under the Geneva Convention, that's a crime. Just someone going in there and committing genocide wasn't necessarily an act of war, even though it technically is. It, but once again, this is part of the whole metaphorical, just part of the metaphor, establishing what metaphorical definitions we have. And right now, what we're, what we're talking about is one of the problems is that we, we both have a different idea of the definition of cyber warfare vice cyber criminality. And that's what we kind of need to establish as a community in order to say, hey, internationally, we've decided that this is cyber warfare. What are our nation states and geopolitical entities going to do about it? Right now, we're, we're just, you know, we're very, dis, not despotic. Uh, we, well, yeah, we don't have an agreement on definitions right now, and that's what we need to build towards first. So, But I agree with you, yes. Was, was it technically an act of warfare? Yeah, technically, yeah. One nation state attacked another nation state. But under, the, under what we legislatively consider declarations of war, they didn't do that. So it's technically a criminal act. It's the fine line between you know, genocide and uh, ethnic cleansing. You know, which one's put under the Geneva Convention, which one is a intranation issue of criminality. So, OK, sorry. World Bank? Yes. Okay, so. Yes, okay, so that was, that was an attempt to try and understand the, what we consider the physical geography of cyberspace. And uh, so the first two maps, the Shodan map and the um, World Bank map, those are what we call Web Mercator maps. And those are technically compromise projections of a 3D world into a 2D map. So cartographically, it's not a very good representation that preserves either area, shape, distance, or direction within cartographic principles two-dimensionally. Um, so when you're looking at the size of the United States versus Iceland versus Antarctica, those, those areas aren't accurate. So you're seeing you're like, oh no, the world, when you look at the colors and you look at the shapes, you're not seeing a true representation of the world as it is. So when you see a, a a bunch of like developed countries having a ton of internet access, and that looks like half the world has internet access, that's incorrect. You know, Africa is obviously much bigger than Iceland in the real world, but on those maps, they don't look like it. So it's, it's to kind of show that population density wise, vice, vice actual physical area, we're not seeing the real picture of what cyberspace technically is physically, both in network topologies and in population density using those, like human minds connecting to the network. So that's why cartograms are a much better way to represent that. So did that answer your question? Okay. 
Any other questions? For people who got here late and just <laughs> don't know what I'm talking about. Yes. Very, very good, uh, very good question. And that was uh, part of the, uh, I kind of rolled them into the state actor category because, oh, sorry. Um, he asked about what, what about the role of capitalist entities within defining cyberspace or as a cyberspace entity or actor? Um, well, that's a, very, that's a very good question, very complicated one, because different countries have different ideas of what a corporate or capitalist entity is. Like in the United States, we have Citizens United, so they're technically a US citizen. But in Europe, they don't have that. In other countries, they definitely don't have that. Um, so, in, but in Western and developed countries, um, you will see capitalist entities being a driver or a persuader of geopolitical entities or state entities um, for obvious reasons. Um, but you can also see that in more despotic regions. You know, countries, any, any country where rich people have influence, obviously rich people are gonna have the corporations they are gonna influence the political system because they place those people in those systems. So it's within, since the world is kind of globalized, you know, via, you know, if you want to go the, the neoliberal, you know, neoliberal globalization route, you know, whether you're a hyperinflationist, hyperglobalist, or something like that, um, you do see capitalist entities as influencers. And are they direct actors? Of course. Um, but they are defined entities that have an interest in creating, like, essentially siege warfare conditions. They, they have their little areas that they consider their own, their areas inside cyberspace that they consider their cyber place, just like state entities do. So what does that mean to the non-state actors? It puts them at odds with open, open, openness to either information or access or both. So does that answer your, your question, kind of, sort of? Okay, so like I said, you can always email me here with your questions and I will totally respond to you like as quick as possible. Any other questions, concerns, comments? Nothing? Okay, thank you very much.